Hi, my name is Cherish Williams, and I'm here to read a book to you all. This book is Anti-Racist, 20 Lessons on How to Wake Up, Take Action, and Do the Work by Tiffany Jewell and Aurelia Duran. So this is a chapter book. I'm only going to read just a few parts of the book and then hopefully you all be able to read the book on your own. So I wanted to start with the author's note because I think it's pretty powerful. To all of you, I wrote this book for you. It is for everyone. The words on these pages are for our ancestors and those who should not, and those who should not yet be our ancestors, but who passed on too soon. I wrote this for you out of a love for liberation and our humanity. This is the book I wish I'd had when I was younger, and it's the book I will share with my own children. It contains information I never learned when I was younger, and you will probably not be taught in school. I wrote these words for you while carrying a heavy heart. It aches for Emmett Till, Tamir Rice, Corin Gaines, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Sandra Bland, Bobby Hutton, Antoine Rose Jr., Stefan Clark, Rakia Boyd, Stephen Lawrence, Charlena Lyles, Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, Ayana Stanley Jones, and Trayvon Martin. And for all of those we honor with hashtags, our tears, our frustration and rage, our exhaustion, and the fire to move on. My optimism has brought me to action and to sharing these words with you because I believe you will help to dismantle and work towards ending racism. We need justice. No one's name should be memorialized in hashtags. My hope is you will use this book as a way to start your journey and the big work of anti-racism. You are resisting racism and oppression just by opening these pages. You are entering into a consciousness that wakes you up and allows you to see the world in a whole new way. Some may tell you you're too young to talk about race. People may tell you that you should stop talking about skin color and see everyone as a global citizen. You may have been told racism isn't a problem anymore and that calling it out or bringing it up in conversation is wrong. Some people may have given you the impression that you are wrong in stirring up trouble. You are not. Racism is a problem, a very serious problem and it needs to be talked about because it isn't going away if we do nothing. It is okay for you to continue on with this book and I am so proud of you for picking this up and opening these pages. Please know you are not alone on this journey. I am here with you. There are many, many folks who are here with you, who came before you and who will come long after us. I hope you will share this book with your friends and families because fighting racism really isn't something you can do all on your own. Make sure to look up underlined words in the glossary if you need help understanding. There are many moments to pause in this book so you can check in with yourself and grow into your activism. You will learn more about yourself, our history, how racism came to be, and why we're still so deep within it. We will work together in solidarity to disrupt racism and become anti-racist accomplices. This book is meant to be read in order. Each chapter builds on a previous chapter and you will gain a deeper understanding of becoming your anti-racist self. And you will probably want to read and reread this. This is a start. Anti-racism is lifelong work. In solidarity, Tiffany. Powerful words by Tiffany. Anti-racist. An anti-racist is a person, an anti-racist person is someone who is opposed to racism. Anti-racism is actively working against racism. It is making a commitment to resisting unjust laws, policies, and racist attitudes. Anti-racism is how we get free from centuries of living in a racialized society that keeps us separate and oppressed. Anti-racist. In this section, so things that'll be addressed, who am I? What are my social identities? What is race? What is racism? It says waking up, understanding and growing into my identities. Waking up, who am I? Who are you? You are you. 
You are the only you there is. There's so much that makes you who you are. Your identity is what makes you, you. It's all the parts that make you unique. You are made up of your family, your friends, your neighborhood, your school, what you see on social media and read in books, what you hear and listen to, what you eat, what you wear, what you feel, your dreams, the stories you cannot wait to share, and those you don't want to tell and everything in between and all around. You are everything within you and everything that surrounds you. You are all the ancestors who came before you, those you've never known, never heard of, never seen, and those you've passed on the street, sat next to and snuggled near. I'm sure you've asked, who am I? And others have asked, who are you? How do you answer? How much of yourself do you share with others, if anything? This is who I was at 14. I'm Tiffany. I'm 14 years old. I live in a small house in New York State. I live with my mom and my twin sister. I am a black, biracial, cisgender female who has brown eyes and a lot of freckles. I have curly hair and have grown to love it. Slowly, over time, I love to read and bake. I love to dance with my friends and I write terrible poetry that only I will ever read. All of that is who I am and I'm so much more. So if you all remember, there is a word here that is underlined and the word is cisgender. So at the back of this book, there is a glossary. So I'm just going to go and read that word for anyone who may not know what it means. Cisgender, when your personal identity and gender expression correspond with the sex you were assigned at birth. The word can be shortened to cis as in cis female or cis male. You get to decide which identities you will share with the world and how you will do so. You get to choose how to name your identities. Your identity grows and changes just like you. There are some things that are static and stay with you always. My skin color and my freckles on my face have been with me for as long as I can remember and will continue on with me until I'm 103 plus. There are other parts of us that change even daily. I can wear my hair up or down. I can wear it braided or straight. I can change the color and length. It's all up to me. Many others will try to get you to fit into an imaginary box. This box includes what we call the dominant culture. If you are white, upper middle class, cisgender, male, educated, athletic, neurotypical, and or able body, you are in this box. So there's another word, neurotypical. Let's go and look that word up. Let's see here, neurotypical, people with typical development and intellectual ability. If you do not fit into this box, you are considered to be a part of what's called the subordinate culture. Folks included in the subordinate culture include black, brown, indigenous people of color of the global majority, queer, transgender and non-binary folks, and cisgender women, youth, Muslim, Jewish, Buddhist, atheist, and non-Christian folks. Neurodiverse folks, folks living with disabilities, those living in poverty and more. There are many more who exist outside of this imaginary box than those who fit inside of it. So we had a couple words there. We had transgender, so let's look that one up. Someone whose gender identity differs from the gender they were assigned at birth, non-binary, folks who identify as having no gender or gender in between or beyond being a man or a woman, it is a diverse category and not every non-binary person feels the same way. And neurodiverse, this term used to describe neurological differences like people with ADHD, autism, dyslexia, or Tourette's, acknowledges that these differences are from genetic variations are often not visible and that folks who are neurodiverse are not sick, badly behaved, or damaged. Okay, so the dominant culture is what has been considered normal and this normal has been created and is man maintained by those who are in the box. 
It is this version of normal that has shaped how we see ourselves in the world around us. Who is smart, beautiful, worthy, a leader, trouble. Many labels and descriptions have been created, so it seems like people either fit neatly into the box or not. I never really did, and you don't have to either. Our many identities make us who we are. They help us others to understand who you are and help you to know more about the folks who are in your life and in the world. They connect us and divide us. Understanding who you are allows you to grow and know more about yourself. It can give you direction and empower you. The world will try to tell you who you are, but you are the only person who gets to decide that. You have the right to be seen and understood without having to compromise who you are. So there's an activity here that has a notebook in it and hopefully you all will get this book so that you can do the activity. I'm gonna skip over the activity though because it's about creating an identity map. All right, dominant culture. Before we move on, check on, check that you understand this term. The dominant culture is a group of people in society who hold the most power and are often but not always in the majority. In the US and the UK, people who are white, middle class, Christian, and cisgender are the dominant culture. They are in charge of the institutions and have established behaviors, values, and traditions that are considered acceptable and the norm in our countries. So waking up, what are my social identities? Your many identities are part of the whole you. One part alone does not define who you are. Some of those parts you create for yourself. Other parts of your identity have been created by society. Society is another way of saying community. These identities have been created, named, framed, and defined by society for a very long time. We call them social identities. Your social identity is the you that relates to other people in society, for example, your neighborhood, city, or country. Much of our culture comes from our social identities and the groups we belong to. Categories. So our social identities are broken down into groups or categories that we get to lump that we get lumped into. This is not always our choice. Others may place you in categories even though you may not identify the same way. This is a way of trying to figure you and others like you out. It is how our communities and countries have been set up for centuries. While the social identity categories can help us to see and understand ourselves and the people around us, they also determine how others will treat us. It is our job to learn and act. First ask, what are these social identities and why do they exist? Analyze them with a critical and conscious eye and then work to undo why this is our current situation. You have the ability to create a new history. All right. In this book, we will focus mostly on our racial identities. But there are many categories within our identities that affect the way we interact with society. You may be familiar with the following. Race, ethnicity, economic class, gender, age, language, religious beliefs, sexual orientation, nationality, abilities, family structure. So I'm not going to go through and read all of the different um, underlined ones anymore, but I am going to take some time just to define race and ethnicity for the purposes of this book, okay? So race is defined as a socially constructed term that divides folks up based on their skin color and physical characteristics. It is not based on scientific fact and it is not grounded in genetics. And then ethnicity, your cultural heritage, languages, traditions, ancestral history. It is not the same as your race, okay? So the parts of your identity that you notice and are most aware of on a daily basis may change depending on where you are, who you are with, and the experiences you continue to have in life. The identities you do not think much about, even the ones you barely notice, are always with you. Privilege. 
Some social identities hold power and privilege, others do not. Even within us, there are parts of us that hold some power and other parts that are oppressed. This is why we work to understand our identities within society. We need to always examine our whole selves. The identities that fit neatly into the imaginary box are typically the ones with the most power and agency. One example of where I have some power is the language I speak. I live in a country where the most commonly spoken language is English. I can read and understand signs and directions. I can walk into a school or store and the folks helping me will likely know that I'm what I'm talking about. I don't have to worry. Privilege is the benefits you receive due to how close you are to the dominant culture. For example, a white cisgender man who is able-bodied, heterosexual, considered handsome and speaks English, has more privilege than a black transgender woman. Those with privilege have power over others. Not everyone has privilege. Folks who do not benefit from their social identities, who are in subordinate culture, have little to no privilege and power. Some of our identities hold privileges and disadvantages at the same time. Because I am cis female, I don't have to think about which restroom I will be able to use. I have agency. But because I am female, I do, have, I do not have the same privileges as a, cis, as a cis male has. I am more likely to be overlooked for a position of leadership and get paid less for the same amount of work. While many cis heterosexual men can confidently walk alone at night, I cannot without feeling some fear that I may be harmed. Although I do not have the same privileges as a white cisgender male, I do have privileges trans and non-binary folks do not have because my cisgender identity is closer to the dominant culture. Intersectionality. Looking at intersectionality helps us to understand how our social identities affect our whole life. Kimberly Crenshaw, a black female lawyer, author, scholar, and civil rights activist, used the term intersectionality in 1989 to help us better understand that being a woman and a black, being a woman and black created greater disadvantages than just being a woman. A black woman is marginalized because she is a woman and because she is black. Her experiences overlap and cause great harm. When you just look at a person through a single lens, you can only narrowly understand them and their experiences. When you look at all of the parts of a person and where they are oppressed, you will better understand how deeply discrimination advances onward. Knowing who we are, where we hold agency, how our identities came to be and how they determine our roles in society help us to understand ourselves and how we can change a system where some folks have privilege and power and some folks are under-resourced and oppressed to one where we are all liberated. We will learn more about privilege in chapter 17, 15 and 17. So there's another activity here where you all get to create a list of social identity categories and reflect on it. So here's an example of what that looks like. So we'll just keep on moving. So waking up part three, what is race and what is ethnicity? In this book, when we talk about race, we are referring to our skin color. People have been divided for centuries based on the differences in skin tone, hair texture, facial features, and cultural heritage. The concept of race is not actually based on science. It is a creation of society. The categories for race have been created over many years by people in the dominant culture. In the mid 1700s, European scientists started to classify people just as they categorized plants and animals. We still study some of them like Carl Linnaeus and Joanne Frederick Blumenbach in our schools today. Their science created a hierarchy of humans which placed Europeans with the lightest skin at the top, indigenous folks and those with the darkest skin were not valued. The racial categories we get lumped into in the US include white, black, or African American, Asian, American Indian, or Alaska Native, or indigenous, Native Hawaiian, or Pacific Islander, 
and multiracial, which are also called biracial or mixed. Your skin color, along with many of your characteristics, were passed down to you from generation to generation. Folks with African ancestry have more melanin than those with European ancestry. Melanin is a pigment in our skin that protects us. So here are some folks with some rich melanin. So melanin is the pigment in our skin that protects us from the UV rays of the sun and takes in vitamin D. The term white includes people with ancestors from Europe, in particular, Northern Europe. They have the least amount of pigmentation. The term black includes folks with ancestors mainly from Africa. This includes African-Americans, folks from Jamaica, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, and other countries in the Caribbean. They have more melanin because they live closer to the equator where there's more sunlight. The term brown includes folks with Asian and or Latinx ancestry. Indigenous refers to folks with whose ancestors were the first people in a particular land or area. Biracial and multiracial folks have ancestry from two or more different categories. So ethnicity. Race often gets confused with ethnicity. Your ethnic identity is your cultural identity. This is also a social construct. Unlike race, which specifically looks at your physical features, ethnicity zeroes in and your family's, and your family's cultural and ancestral heritage, like language, traditions, and history. To place you into categories, some examples of ethnicities are Japanese American, Caribbean Navajo, and Sudanese. Often, where you are from will partly determine your ethnicity. The names for these divisions, as well as the definition of race, have changed and continue to do so. For example, in the past, people used the term Caucasian to refer to those with a lack of melanin. The word was popularized in the late 1800s by German anthropologist we mentioned earlier, Johann Frederick Blumenbach, he referred to Europeans and the people who lived in the Caucasus region as the most beautiful race of men. This, of course, was based on his opinion and not on scientific data. So in this book, we will refer to white people as white. Another people of how the names, and I'm sorry, excuse me, another example of how the names of the categories have changed is the term mulatto. When I was a kid, many folks, including teachers and families, referred to me using that word rather than calling me biracial. Mulatto means young mule. It was once believed that children with a black parent and a white parent were like the mule from two different species. While the word mulatto is still used today, it is not acceptable. I am not a mule, I am a whole person. The official categories for race change depending on where you are in the world. In the United States, there are five categories for race. White American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, Black or African American, and Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. In South Africa, the racial categories are Black African, colored, Indian or Asian, white, and other. Colored refers to bi and multiracial folks. White, mestizo, and Black are the categories used in Uruguay. Mestizo refers to folks who have European and indigenous ancestry. In the United Kingdom, the categories for people are a mix of racial and ethnic identities. They include white, mixed multiple ethnic groups, Asian, Asian British, black, African Caribbean, black British, and other ethnic groups. Seeing how every country has a different way of classifying people shows us that race and ethnicity really are social constructions. The words I use to describe my race have changed over the years. My dad is black and my mom is white. I have light brown skin, many freckles across my face, brown eyes and curly hair. My ethnic identity encompasses all I know about my family background, English, African-American, French, Irish, and I've been told Seuss. When I was a kid, our school district labeled us as white. Maybe because I lived with my white mom, maybe because of my light skin, 
maybe to fill some statistical quota. I don't know. I am black biracial. Race is confusing. There is, of course, no scientific evidence that proves folks with the lightest skin are smarter, prettier, and better. But this has been the way we, as a species, have been doing things for centuries. Ta-Nehisi Coates writes in Between the World, Between the World and Me, but race is the child of racism, not the father. We have been taught to categorize people based on their skin color their nation of origin and their physical features by the people with the most power. People in the dominant culture have worked for centuries to create laws, policies, and institutions to guarantee that they will always maintain that power. We'll look more closely at this in the next chapters. So there's another activity here where the author is asking you to take a deep breath and reflect on your own race and ethnicity. So let's keep it moving. All right, waking up part four, what is racism? So this is personal. Someone described racism to me as the smog we breathe. It is all around us. Racism is everywhere. Our lives are polluted with racism and it harms us. The more we are aware of this smog of racism, the better equipped we can become to combat this toxic way of being. When folks hear the word racism, many different things come up because there are multiple different explanations and interpretations. Everyone has their own understanding and beliefs around racism. Some of the ones you may be most familiar with are, racism is a system of advantages and disadvantages based on race. Prejudice plus power equals racism. It is prejudice or discrimination against someone based on race. The belief that members of each race have different characteristics because of this, folks believe that some are inferior and some are superior. The best definition I've ever heard came from an anti-racist training I did several years ago. Racism is a personal prejudice and the systemic misuse and abuse of power by institutions. When I refer to racism, this is the definition I'm using. Racism is a personal prejudice and bias and the system misuse and abuse of power by institutions. Thought I'd just say that again. All right, so using this understanding of racism allows us to see how it truly impacts our lives. We have a lot of work ahead of us to break it down. Racism is not just prejudice. Everyone has prejudices or biases. These are our judgments the things we discriminate against, some of our prejudices are conscious and some are not. They are things we've learned and assumed from everything around us. This includes the stereotypes we've witnessed. Whether you are in the dominant culture or not also contributes to your prejudices. We begin to form prejudices when we are two years old. Our biases are absorbed, we take them in and they become a part of our belief system, but they can change. So the beauty, and many places in the world, people have absorbed the bias that light skin and the European features are the most desirable. White people are considered to be the standard for beauty. Does this sound familiar? We can thank Linnaeus and Blumenbach for this. For hundreds of years, people have believed and passed on the belief. For hundreds of years, people have believed and passed on the belief that folks with darker skin are inferior. Those with the lightest skin have been treated the best, have had the most power, and continue to pass along the biases that light skin is superior. To be considered beautiful, to fit into the box of what is considered normal, some folks try to lighten their skin with bleaching creams and some used chemicals to alter their hair. I spent several of my young teen years trying to force my naturally curly hair into straight white hair. Here's some really nice pictures of hair, and the hairs have combs in them that say Afro. This cost my mom a lot of money. I wasted a lot of time sitting in the salon chair, and it caused a lot of pain on my head. The beautician placed a series of chemicals on my scab to rearrange my curls, to undo the natural texture, and then again, several hours, after several hours, straighten my hair with a very hot, hot iron. 
This effect did not last very long. After about six weeks, my hair started to grow and my kinky roots showed. The process of trying to not have curls caused burns on my scalp, which took weeks to heal, and my hair to break in large chunks. I kept this going until I was 15, when the kid whose locker was next to mine saw my curls after swimming. He said, why don't you keep your hair like that? I didn't have a good answer for him or for myself. I kept my natural curls after that. My prejudice against my own curly hair and my desire to look more like my white friends caused me to dislike a part of myself. We have been conditioned to the bias of whiteness. We can undo this. People play a big role in helping racism going in help keeping racism going. If we do not work to recognize our prejudices, we remain a part of the problem. When we became aware of our biases and our role in racism, then we can begin to understand how we are a part of a system that is much bigger than us. Racism is a part of our society, but it doesn't have to be. So there's another activity here where she's asking you to describe who you are. All right. So part five, waking up. What is racism institutional? What we do not know, our lack of information and knowledge contributes to our prejudices and biases. Many people, moments and movements have been left out of history. The stories have almost always been told by those in the dominant culture. When you don't see black and brown folks on TV and in movies, when their stories are not in our history books, you begin to draw your own conclusions about why you regularly see white actors, authors, and models. This becomes your normal and it is easy to go along with this ordinary way of life. When you only read one account of history through a single lens, you do not have the whole truth. In school, we learned about local history in Syracuse, New York. It's a mid-sized city on the land that once belonged to the Haudenosaunee, I'm sure I said that incorrectly, the Haudenosaunee people. We learned about the different tribes that made up the Confederacy and about the Anandagas who lived in long houses and cultivated that land on what is now called Syracuse. Our teachers taught us a little about the Onondagas. We learned about how they lived a long time ago, about Hiawatha and Wapum. We learned about the Haudenosaunee people in the past tense. Our teachers never invited anyone from the Onondaga Nation to speak to our classroom, never showed us pictures or read us stories and articles from local indigenous authors, artists, and activists. Because of that, we, like many students in the United States, believe Native Americans only existed in history. If stories of resistance and accomplishments are purposefully left out of our history books or told from the perspective of those in a dominant culture, we have no voice. No one knows who we are and what we exist. The legacies and that we exist. The legacy we are left with is one that has been shaped by the oppressors. The Black Panther Party created the Free Breakfast for Children program, which is present in so many American neighborhoods and schools. But we may only know the Black Panther Party from the biased headlines from newspapers. You may only see photos of them being arrested and build your own conclusions that they were violent, knowing who the members of the Black Party, knowing who the members of the Black Panther Party are, their goals for their people, and learning about their resistance lets us be better stewards of the truth. If I hadn't learned their own words, I would have never known. Some nice pictures here about the Black Panther Party. It says, People's Free Food Program. All right, so what are institutions? Examples of institutions are the government, media and entertainment, business, housing, banks, the criminal justice system, education, and healthcare. Institutions create laws, policies, programs, and rules. People make up these institutions. Together, people and our institutions create a solid structure of racism through policies, rules, and opportunities that give more resources to one group than another. Here are some examples. Business. 
Although discrimination in the workplace is illegal, it continues to happen. According to recent studies, on average, 24% of black indigenous persons of color have experienced racial discrimination at work across Europe. This number climbs to 44% in Italy. Discrimination based on skin color, physical appearance, accent, and country of birth were all reasons cited by respondents in the study. In the U.S., businesses and corporations are allowed to have dress codes, which can include very strict rules about the type of clothes you are allowed to wear, whether you can have visible tattoos and piercings, and how you wear your hair. Employers can create guidelines around neutral hairstyles, hairstyles and if a person is not able to adhere to these, they can be asked to leave or be fired. Businesses are supposed to respect racial differences under the Civil Rights Act. However, they can have policies that specifically say what type of hairstyles are not allowed. It is, a, still, a, it is still legal for employers to ban dreadlocks. So we have some really good pictures here on structural, on strict business rules, structural racism, systematic racism, and also restrictions on who one can love. All right, so it's still legal for employers to ban dreadlocks. This is anti-black policy. And until 2018, the US Navy banned dreadlocks, braids, and top knot buns which all styles were often worn by black binary femmes and women. In the UK, businesses and corporations can set any dress code they like, whether they are respectful to racial differences or not. Housing. The richest borough in London, UK, is Kensington and Chelsea. It's also where you will find the greatest income inequality among the city's residents. Homes are the most expensive in this borough, and some of the only affordable housing for working class poor folks was in the 27-story Greenfield Tower public housing complex. While people living just a block away were able to afford clean, safe, reliable housing, the residents of Greenfield were repeatedly ignored when they complained about poor living conditions and the cheap materials used for the building's upkeep. No one took the resident's complaints seriously. On June 14, 2017, a fire broke out in the apartment on the fourth floor. It was caused by a faulty freezer. Residents did not hear fire alarms because there were none. The 350 folks living in its 127 apartments were encouraged to stay put unless there was a fire inside their home. As the tower became quickly engulfed in flames, many residents were trapped and 72 folks, mostly black indigenous people of color and those living close to and in poverty died. London Mayor Sadiq Khan was criticized, has criticized the government's response to the tragedy. Lawyer Amran Khan QC has also said investigations failed to consider institutional racism and the safety breaches. Discrimination in housing isn't solely an issue in the UK. It is a global issue. In the city of Philadelphia in the United States, black folks are three times less likely than their white counterparts to receive a loan. While 69% of white people own homes, only 44% of black people do. And for over a decade, black home ownership has been in the on the decline. Flint, Michigan has one of the highest proportions of black indigenous people of color residents with 57% being black African-American in the United States. There, folks have not had clean, safe water supply to drink since April, 2014. Michigan's mayor has said race and class were factors for this slow response to getting clean drinking water to, into the homes of Flint. Government and justice. In South Africa, the government in 1948 was the Nationalist Party, which was made up of white colonists. This government enacted the system of apartheid from 1948 to 1990s. Apartheid was legalized racism and its purpose was to keep people segregated based on their race and to keep white people with power in power. Later on in chapter eight, 
You will read more about Stephen Lawrence and how the UK criminal justice system misused their power. It took 19 years to find Stephen's killers guilty, and even then only two of the five folks who were involved in the attack were convicted. After, in after an inquiry into the London Metropolitan Police Force, the results found the police department to uphold institutional racism. Education. Less than 20% of teachers in the United States public schools are folks of the global majority, while over 50% of their student population are. Teachers are more likely to send black and brown students to detention for being disrespectful. This is supported by rules that won't let students wear natural hairstyles, curriculums that don't reflect our cultures, and a teaching force that is predominantly white. Black, Asian, indigenous, biracial, and multiracial children are twice as likely as their white classmates to be referred to law enforcement from their schools or even arrested at their schools. Students can be arrested for disorderly conduct, which can be anything from repeatedly speaking out in class and not handing in your phone to, get into, to getting into a physical fight with another student. Anything that can disrupt a normal teaching day. In the UK, only 1.5% of Cambridge and 1.2% of Oxford University first year students were folks of the global majority in 2017. While this percentage is much higher in the US, Black and Latinx folks are still represented less than white students. Healthcare. This is a long, there's a long history of racism in medicine in the UK and the United States. From the unethical forced experimentation on enslaved folks to immigrants being denied health care due to lack of citizenship, personal biases held by doctors and the historical oppression of black, brown, and indigenous folks have not only led to a deep mistrust of medical professionals, but also to a lower life expectancy for black, indigenous people of color. Around 4% of doctors in the U.S. are Black, and about 6% of doctors are Latinx. While white and non-Black doctors are more likely to hold anti-Black biases, which affect the way they treat patients, studies find that one of the biases held is believing Black folks have a higher tolerance for pain, which results in doctors not believing them when they are seeking help. Black Indigenous people of color experience unequal treatment to white patients, who experience the same ailments and doctors tend to lecture black indigenous people of color and not respectfully communicate to them. This leads to a sense of internalized inferiority in patients who are less likely to seek the support of medical professionals. Without training to notice biases and address them, folks of the global majority will continue to have a lower life expectancy. Remember, Institutions rely on people to maintain or change racism. So there's an activity here that goes um, to ask you who noticing who's in power in some of the institutions around you, such as like who's the head of your school or who runs different um, the, some of the biggest organizations, who your teachers are. All right. So we're going to go ahead and stop there. This is an amazing, powerful book. Um, there are many more chapters that go on. And I just read the first chapter that had, I believe, five different sections of it. So hopefully you all enjoy this book. I can't wait for you all to read it and do some of the activities in it. Thank you for paying attention and allowing me to read to you all today.